I was born in St. Louis uh, in a hospital and uh, grew up in Webster Groves, Missouri, which is just outside of St. Louis, uh, until I uh, met my husband and we moved to Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, my parents were, uh, my dad's name was Edmund, Edwin Brockmeyer, and uh, my mother's name was Mildred Pauls, until Mildred Pauls Brockmeyer. I have one sister uh, whose name is Suzanne, Suzanne Rauschen, and she now lives in Prairie Grove. Uh, my father uh, received a degree in architecture, and he became a building contractor. My mother uh, went through Central Institute for the Deaf as a teacher, and she was quite well known and quite well respected. My husband uh, is Jerry Hinshaw, and uh, yeah, we, uh, we met at Ralston Purina. That's where I, I worked I, after I graduated from Washington University and went to Miss Hickey's Secretarial School. That's a terrible name, but uh, Dad wanted me to be able to do something in case I ever had to be out on my own. And so uh, I was on the fifth floor at Ralston Purina. I was a secretary. He was down on the first floor. And uh, so one day I asked uh, one of my bosses if there were any eligible men around. And he said, uh, here's, here's some papers. Take them down to Jerry Hinshaw. So I did, and uh, nothing developed for a while. <laughs> But eventually it did. He was in the poultry business in Purina. And um, Purina moved us first to uh, Jacksonville, Florida, and then he resigned and went to Dallas with uh, Western Hatcheries. And then somehow, I don't really know how, he uh, contacted he and Arbor Acres Farm out of Glastonbury, Connecticut got together. And Henry Saglio, the president, wanted my husband to find a place in southeastern part of the United States uh, where we could set up a, another branch office. And uh, so dra Jerry traveled all around, but he, uh, he really did like this area it was so pretty. It had uh, the hills. It had places to build the chicken houses. It was, a lot of it was developing chicken country. And so this is where he decided to move us, his, his family to move us here. Well, I have four of the most wonderful kids possible. And, um, they were all born in the 1950s, so I thought that was a pretty good record. And, and uh, my oldest was uh, Anita Louise, who uh, became Sunny. Uh, my second was Kathy Elizabeth, who she named herself Catherine. My third was uh, Ross Edwin, and my fourth was Dawn Marie. Well, my daughter, Sunny, I don't really know what piqued her interest in deciding to run, except that uh, she didn't believe that uh, Tawny Town, well, I don't quite know how to say it, but I guess uh, she decided it would be a good idea for her to run because she had some other ideas about the government. And uh, so she ran in uh, 2008 and served in 2009 and 2010. And uh, then later she uh, served in 2013 and 2014. And uh, she was, uh, she never let anything get under her skin. She, she was very good like that, just like her father. And uh, she studied hard. She ordered the 
books of ordinances and law and studied them and uh, knew the people to talk to in the municipal league, wherever she had to. So she, she really took to it like a duck to water. I saw my first snake. <laughs> Jerry promised me I wouldn't have any snakes, but I did. Uh, he let me off at the creek down there. It was so pretty with watercress and all, and it flowed out of the spring house uh, under the road and into this stream. And I got out and looked at it, and there was a snake right there in the watercress. So that was my first memory. Uh, when he told us that we were going to move here, I, uh, well, I grew up in St. Louis. I lived in Jacksonville, Florida. I lived in Dallas. And I said, Arkansas? And please, Jerry, just be sure there's a doctor there. And so th that was my vision of what Arkansas was, you know, very, very country. And uh, I had never lived in the country. So I loved it. I just loved it. But the roads were very, very dusty. It was not a paved road where we, uh, that we lived on. Uh, and um, it was just completely different from anything I had ever experienced. But I grew to love it, except for the dust. What was the town like? Well, um, it was not very big. It, uh, I remember mainly uh, the tiny town mercantile that Richard Ardemani had because uh, he just, he carried so many different things. And I would run up a bill there every now and then and get myself in trouble. But I, uh, I don't really remember except 68 was two lane. It's now 412 and four lane with a suicide lane and uh, houses, houses galore everywhere. And it's just not as much country as it used to be, but it's still beautiful. Ralph and Nancy Pendergraf had a uh, produce market up uh, on 412 where Arvest is now. Ralph hired my daughter Kathy, Catherine, and uh, to work up there. She was in high school. And one day he went into the cooler to get out a watermelon and Kathy closed the door and locked it. <laughs> and so Ralph sat in the cooler until somebody let him out. Kathy finally let him out and he was he didn't get angry at all. He was just sitting there with his face in his hand, just taking it easy. <laughs> Good-natured man. Good-natured man. We moved into an old house on Route 4 that uh, Joe Steele once lived in. It was built in 1903, and uh, it became uh, Wheeler Road and then Barrington Road. And it, uh, it did not have a bathroom. So when Jerry told us we were going to move here, he uh, worked night and day to uh, fix that old house. And uh, he put in a bathroom. And so that's what made it what they called modern. If you had a bathroom, it was modern. We moved in 1956 into that house, and uh, the uh, the wall the windows didn't quite fit anymore. The floors sloped a little bit. Uh, the uh, not very many cabinets in the kitchen, but uh, the uh, the best thing was having a bathroom put in. Yes, we loved to go to the restaurants. Uh, there was, uh, oh, let's see, Mary Maestri's. That was the most famous one. And uh, Ed Maestri was such a good host. And it was in an old house and had so much atmosphere. 
and really good spaghetti, really good spaghetti. And I remember that uh, Lois Artemani worked there and she was so good, so friendly. She was a, a, a waitress. And then another place was the uh, Venetian Inn and uh, who was it that worked there that was so good that we loved to always to go back there too. It was uh, Pinalto, um, Eloise. Oh, I can't think what her name was. But and then of course Mama Z's, and that was uh, with Elsie Zupo and Julie Zupo, and they were always friendly greeters. So Toddy Town was a good place to eat. We ate there a lot. Well, of course there were the workers here for Arbor Acres Farm. And the clay pools were the ones I would remember the most, and they were so reliable. Uh, Slim and Opal Claypool, and they had four children. Uh, then there was Ravenel Claypool, and I can't remember her husband's name, but uh, one of their daughter, their daughter was named uh, Janadel. And my daughter, Catherine, played with Janadel. They became real good friends. And their son, Doug, Douglas, had a sad ending. He, uh, he got his car in the creek down here. And I don't know whether he was knocked out when his car went into the creek or what, but the tailpipe was down in the water. And so he died of monoxide poisoning. And uh, one of Opal's sons, their only son, Charles, he was killed in an automobile wreck. So there were three daughters left, and they were wonderful, wonderful girls. Um, who else do I remember? Well, there were the, the uh, managers of the Arbor Acres Farm, Ronnie Delosier, and then there was uh, uh, Joe Stubblefield, and then uh, his wife, Kathleen, and their daughter, Teresa, played with my daughter, Dawn. They were real good buddies. And then there was Barbara and, and well, Morris Looper and her, his wife, Barbara. And uh, they had four children. And all of my children and their children were real good buddies. And we often, well, in fact, I learned from Barbara Looper that you could make tuna fish salad with apples if you didn't have any celery. So I thought that was nice. And Morris, I remember one thing about him in particular. We had a dog that got into some poison, and that poor dog was in such pain. And Morris brought a gun up and shot him and put him out of his pain. And I remember that with, I thought that was so nice of him, kind of him to do that. He worked like the Dickens, I can tell you that. Uh, my husband, uh, in his work, uh, of course, he was the general manager. He raised, he saw to it that uh, these breeder type chickens were raised here and they were sold all over. It became one of the biggest operations for Arbor Acres that there was. And uh, he built a hatchery and he built chicken houses for 66,000 chickens. That lasted for several years, and then he got into the cattle business and other things that he was interested in. When Jerry first came here, and uh, he had built a hatchery, and the chickens were laying eggs, uh, Jerry asked Margie Hull and me to weigh the eggs. And we were down in what I called the old house, the one that Joe Steele had lived in. In this little room, with uh, shaky windows on both sides and a door. And uh, then there was a door into a uh, cellar built into the hill for, you know, in case of a tornado or anything. But uh, my washing machine and my dryer were out there and we had a little scales. And so Margie, they bring in these uh, orange wire baskets filled with eggs 
and Margie and I would weigh these eggs and then put them in small, medium, and large containers, and which was fine at first. You know, we just did really well. But the eggs just kept coming and coming and coming until it was all we could do to find a place to put our feet. And we were so grateful that we never stepped in a basket of eggs. We never did, but we could have. So uh, I, that, Margie and I had fun. It was cold in the winter though, because that, that wind came through. And, uh, but we got those eggs weighed and it was quite an experience. That was how we really helped Jerry get started. My husband got involved in politics, uh, according to some uh, notes that I read, and thanks to Brenda Blagg, I have saved uh, several newspaper articles, and she wrote quite extensively about him. He went up to Washington, D.C., uh, and while he was up there, he saw, he realized that uh, Jim Trimble who had been a good congressman for many, many years for the third district was not well and not doing as, as well as he could have done or had done. And so he came back and decided uh, to try to find somebody to run for, uh, as a Republican against Jim Trimble. And he ended up being the one that did it. And so uh, it was a hard race. He worked his tail off and he, he lost, but he got 47% of the vote. So that was good. And he set up the, the road for uh, John Paul Hammerschmidt and John Paul always gave Jerry credit for that. Well, I met Winthrop Rockefeller in 1964 he was running for governor, and Jerry was running against Jim Trimble. And I tell you, Winthrop Rockefeller, he was a peach. He was just the nicest gentleman. And um, I didn't see much of, of him because uh, if I was going anywhere, it was with Jerry, and, and they didn't try, uh, Winthrop Rockefeller and Jerry didn't travel together at all, that I remember anyway. So, uh, but we had a, a uh, lawn party for Mr. Rockefeller, and it was in the summer, it was hot, and we, I remember I had a bowl of shrimp out there in the yard and the flies were just gathering there and I was waving the flies away. And Winthrop Rockefeller came up to thank me and he kissed my hand. And you know what women do when that happens, they don't wash their hand for a week. So that was the most of what I remember about him, except having dinner occasionally with him, uh, you know, when my Jer Jerry would uh, eat with him, I, I'd go along. And I was up at Petty Jean one time when um, he held some kind of a political gathering, and that was a beautiful, beautiful spot. My husband, also in politics, uh, he did get into the legislature, but before that, he served four years as Justice of the Peace. Uh, for Washington County because he saw that uh, the county was changing. He said, I don't know how it was changing. But then from there, he decided to run for uh, state legislature. And uh, let's see, what year was that? That was 1980, I think. And uh, he, he ran a hard race. You know, I can't remember who he was running against. But anyway, he, he won and he served for 16 years. Did a good job. Uh, one of the funniest things he did was to, um, and the law was passed, to make farmers responsible for uh, 
uh, getting rid of the thistles in their fields because cattle won't eat when the fields are filled with thistles. And so uh, the law was passed, and if you saw somebody with thistles in their pastures and you reported him, he got, he had to get rid of the thistles or else he got fined. And so Mike Golden then made a cartoon of that and said, uh, hey, fella, what are you in for? And uh, the fellow said, marijuana. And uh, the fellow said, no, what I'm in for is I sat on a thistle in Jerry's in, in a, somebody's pasture and I got caught. <laughs> so anyway, but the, the most important uh, law that Jerry felt that he passed was the visual acuity test. Because uh, according to some notes I had, Arkansas was the only state without a test for that. And so many old people were driving, they couldn't really see well. So Jerry felt that he really saved a lot of lives by getting that law passed. I don't know why Bill Clinton called him his favorite Republican, except that they got along well. That's all I can say. Jerry, as a state representative, was very, very helpful. I don't know how many people have told me that he helped each one so much. And in Tawny Town, I kind of feel like one of the best things he did, and one of the, I don't know if it was the first thing he did or not, but he felt as though the <clears throat> fire insurance for the family should come down. But they were at, at a very high rate because there was no fire department here. And so he and Leon Zulpo, they formed a firm friendship. And Leon was a wonderful fellow, as was his wife, Sally. And uh, they got a, what was it called? A brush fire truck. And uh, then, uh, I don't remember much about that, but the first fire engine that they got, they got secondhand in Oklahoma. And I think they paid $15,000 for it. And uh, Jerry said they just, he and Leon just hooped and hollered all the way back from Oklahoma driving behind that fire truck. And of course, that's one of the best things that, that could, and now, you know, Tawny Town has beautiful fire trucks and, and I don't know how many, but uh, the, the fire rates have certainly come down, insurance rates, yeah. Well, Sonny and Kathy started up at Stony Point. That was on Highway 112. And it's two-room schoolhouse, two holer outhouses, uh, one for boys and one for girls. Uh, they took their lunches, and they had the most wonderful teacher, Mrs. Helen Mount. Mr. Ann T. Griffith was the principal. And it really is true, schools draw the com community together. That's how we got to know a lot of the people here uh, in this area, because we help wax the floors, we wash the windows, we uh, help with curtains. Uh, I tried to play the piano for their Christmas uh, play, and of course I hit sour notes galore. And, uh, but, we really did uh, work together well, and, and it was fun. And so then, when the Springdale schools consolidated, uh, they all moved into uh, Springdale and closed up Stony Point. So, uh, but I remember Dawn told me that uh, when she was in Springdale, going to those schools that I, I, I don't know how this happened. She said a new world opened for her because she met so many tiny town people. And I guess that must have been about the time that the uh, Catholic school closed. And so the tiny town people came into Springdale. But she told me about, uh, oh, let's see, who was it? Denise Franco, I think, and Carla. Artemani and and uh, Lara Zupo 
And a real good friend was Mark Artemani and, oh, and Aggie Maestri, whose father was mayor at one time of Tawny Town. So those were a few of her friends. And uh, my, my son, he made friends with, uh, uh, I remember, uh, who, who was Zupo? Uh, Okay. Well, anyway, one of the Zupo boys, Bill Zupo, that's who it was. Joe Reed and Jimmy Russell, so local boys. Yeah. What would they do for fun? Hmm. I know Ross and his friends, they found a cave over uh, along uh, Reed Valley Road, that, that stream over there. And I never did see that cave. And when the mothers found out about it, though, they, they were a little unhappy because it could have been dangerous. What did they do? Well, I know we had a lot of parties up here uh, for the school kids, ice cream parties and uh, Halloween parties and things like that. But as, oh, I know, I remember now, uh, they had their bikes to ride. And uh, Sonny and Kathy started working for uh, the Egg Depot, and they got 25 cents an hour. Now, I don't know how old they were, but uh, Kathy said that, that uh, I made them put it in a savings account, and, but I let them have $1 a week. And so they would, she and her sister, Sonny, would get on their bikes, and Ross says he remembers this too, riding a bike up to Tiny Town Mercantile and buying an RC Cola and a Moon Pie and a comic book. And then they'd sit in the shade someplace and enjoy. What do I remember about the Tiny Town Grape Festival? Uh, is that uh, people were enjoying it that the uh, spaghetti suppers were grand. They were so good. And I remember playing bingo. I love to play bingo. And that was the thing I enjoyed most about the, the grape festival. I do remember the first time, I don't know what year it was, that they introduced grape ice cream. And we could get a grape ice cream cone so that was a little different. I wasn't real sure that I liked it. But that's, it was just a, a big gathering. People came. I mean, they worked on making spaghetti for weeks, the Italian people, and uh, it was always a success. And Winthrop Rockefeller spoke up there one night when he was governor. And Jerry also spoke up there one night, and it was raining cats and dogs. It seemed like it always rained one night during the Grape Festival. I never did help with anything uh, concerning the Grape Festival except by giving my money to eat the dinner. As far as uh, campaigning around uh, Tawny Town, um, at one time, uh, Jerry had a uh, little campaign trailer up there at Tawny Town and, uh, that I ran that, uh, you know, where people could come in and ask about Jerry and get campaign literature. But when he first ran, uh, he had, when he ran for state representative, he had an office in Springdale on Emma Avenue. And Marty Taldo, who lives right up the road, he hired her and she and I ran that office. And we had great fun. And people came in and got campaign literature and uh, we answered the phone, we typed letters, we, uh, anything that was needed there, we, we did. And uh, we made a success of it too. Marty Taldo was a good person to work with. Well, the fact I remember changes, one of the things, of course, is the paving of 
the road in front of our house. That was a big, big change. And uh, because at first there weren't too many cars that came along. And when one did come, we'd run to the door, and uh, I would, to see who it was, see if I recognized it. And, uh, but as time went on, this uh, Barrington Road has become a speedway, really. Uh, other changes, let's see. Of course, 68 becoming bigger. We had a female up at the corner, the southwest corner of uh, 68 and uh, what is now Barrington, and it burned down. And Ross can remember I, uh, Louis Perona and Jerry uh, pulling the vehicles, the uh, trucks, out of that burning building before they caught on fire. And I, I think that was pretty bold of them and very dangerous. But they got the trucks out, and the feed mill burned to the ground. So uh, what other changes might I remember? Um, the fact that uh, there uh, were no houses. There used to be hog houses on that hill across the road. Uh, that was gone. Uh, the Barrington Road gradually got more houses, and of course now, uh, at closer you get to uh, Highway 412, the more little uh, groups of houses that you see, you know, subdivisions, that's the word I want. When we first moved here, and this uh, road was uh, just a gravel road, there was a woman up uh, Arbor Acres Road, of course it wasn't called Arbor Acres Road, but she was in her uh, reaching for some corn in her the corn house, or whatever you called it, and she was bitten by a copperhead, and uh, on the on her hand when she reached up for the corn, and she hitched up horses to a cart, a horse I guess to a cart, got a bowl of kerosene, and kept that arm in that bowl of kerosene and took that horse up into Springdale for treatment for her arm. Now, isn't that a tale? I, um, she was a brave woman. She was a brave woman. Well, it's full of friendly people, it's full of good places to eat, and it is growing. It's just in a lovely spot in the United States. Our property in Tawny Town is, uh, oh, about two and a half miles from Highway 412, south of it. And people recognize it because of the lake that Jerry had built. There was just a stream running through it at one time. And uh, so he had that all dug out and the dam built that our drive is on. And then he couldn't make the water stick. It kept leaking out. And I've forgotten what it was that he finally found to uh, throw down there on that ground. And then he had the cows come in and stamp on it all. And then the stream finally filled the lake and made the lake. And um, people have come to fish on it ever since. He always allowed people to fish. and. Uh, one thing that's happened lately is that the uh, firemen and policemen of, of Tawny Town and Elm Springs have held a fishing derby for children uh, in June from like 8 to 11, and they give prizes for the biggest fish. And uh, I don't know what the other prizes are. I think they give three. But they, uh, they have it stocked by the Game and Fish Commission. And so they put like five or 800 pounds of catfish in there. And so the children just have a really good time. And I'm just thrilled that they do that. It's wonderful. They take care of the 
getting it mowed. They get the little porta potties out there, the policemen, and they do everything, take care of it. I have nothing to do with it except just offer it, open it for them to use.